Someone more cynical than myself might attribute My Hero Academia's success to the popularity of superheroes in media today. However, I would remind them that riding a wave of popularity means having to know how to surf and not brain yourself on the ocean floor. Between a cast of diverse characters and an engaging protagonist's journey, My Hero Academia certainly earns its spot amongst the top tier superhero stories. That is what I'm here to discuss. Why does this show swim in a genre full of sinkers? Before we begin, there are three things you should know about this video going in. First, there will be significant spoilers for My Hero Academia's first season, and some minor spoilers for up to and including season 5. However, there will be no manga spoilers, because I don't read the manga. Second, given how much effort the show puts into making every member of Class 1A a unique character, I want to make sure that I say something about all of them. I have more to say about some characters than others, but that will change as this retrospective series goes on. Lastly, this isn't necessarily an analysis. I don't have a thesis statement on this show, a theme I want to discuss, or a through line to connect everything. I just think it's neat, and I want to discuss why. The introductory scene of My Hero Academia showcases one of its two main strengths. The diversity of superheroes, superpowers, and applications for those superpowers. The different heroes fulfilling different roles in the battle against the monster bag snatcher set up that this isn't entirely a you punch me, I punch you story. That different participants in a fight will recognize their strengths in battle and contribute accordingly. The other selling point is the growth of our main character, which partly begins in this scene by showcasing his passion for heroes. His raw determination to become a hero gives us some insight into where Midoriya is starting the story. Another vital aspect of this starting point is the adversity Midoriya faces from all those around him. It seems that everyone, classmates, teachers, and even his mother to a lesser extent, has written him off. Especially Katsuki Bakugo, who I am not quite ready to talk about yet. Having an underdog protagonist is nothing new. But the fact that those talking him down actually have a point means that the trope is a little more effective. They're wrong to treat Midoriya as useless, but they only become wrong about his ability to become a hero retrospectively, after he attains the power he lacked before. Midoriya hits his lowest point in the show when his number one idol, All Might, confirms that someone without a quirk cannot become a hero. Young Midoriya has a lot on his mind following this revelation. His favourite hero is secretly on the decline, he's aided the escape of a deadly villain, and his hero has just told him that he cannot fulfil his lifelong ambition. Midoriya had likely been fighting with this thought from the moment he learnt he was quirkless, but to have All Might of all people tell him point blank is what finally made him accept this reality. But then, he gets a defining moment. He witnesses the aforementioned release villain killing his childhood friend. An animal-like instinct takes over as he charges at the monster with no plan, no means of helping, and no clue why he's doing any of it. Just an instinct to help. This wholly selfless act not only inspires All Might to push just a little harder to resolve the issue, but it also shows him that Midoriya has something that no one could ever teach him. The instincts of a true hero. My Hero Academia came out at an appropriate time for me personally, since I was a fresh-faced university student with dreams of success in an industry that I had hardly glimpsed. And I was regularly told that my ambitions were too far beyond what someone with my connections could do. So I could relate to the quirkless Midoriya being told by his idol that being a hero is outside his scope of possibilities. And as you can imagine, when All Might finally tells Midoriya the words he had been waiting his whole life to hear, you can become a hero, I was crying right alongside him. The show had my attention from that scene. Of course, there are plenty of reasons to love My Hero Academia, but this is the scene that initially hooked me in the first place, so that I would stick around long enough to see it. 
While the adversarial nature of side characters does not stop when Midoriya arrives at UA for the entrance exam, we do get some respite from it. Amongst antagonistic forces like Ida and Aoyama, we get introduced to the first side character that is nice to Midoriya, and the best side character in the show, Ochako Uraraka. Here we Go. As stated above, we immediately like Ochako because she is one of the few characters who doesn't treat Midoriya harshly before he begins attending UA. Her round eyes and head shape give off a cute vibe, as opposed to the more punk aesthetic of Jiro, the more conventionally attractive appearance of Momo, or the terrifyingly intimidating scowl of Toru. She also has an upbeat attitude to match, only abandoning her jovial tone in dire situations. Best of all, she's the one who starts Midoriya's path to self-love. He only decides to reclaim the name Deku because she encouraged him to, which becomes an essential part of his early arc in asserting himself over Bakugo. There's so much more I love about Ochako, but unfortunately her best moments lie outside of the first season so I'll have to discuss them in a future retrospective. It's a shame that the showrunners decided to put her in danger the way they did during the entrance exam. Now, I get why they did it, and I'm going to explain what we got out of this scene in just a moment, but are you really telling me that the best way to put Ochako in danger was to crush her under a heavy piece of debris? Again, I understand what this scene is here to do. It's meant to reinforce Midoriya's heroic instinct and contrast his ability to help now from his inability to assist in the past. This moment ultimately gets him into UA, and I am glad that the selection criteria take those instincts into account, even though we find out later in the show that the selection criteria are still very much flawed. Also, it is very badass that Ochako saves Midoriya right back, and has to pay her own price for doing so. It doesn't excuse the contrivance she needed to be protected from, but it's still a nice touch. It seems as though Midoriya is not free of adversaries even after entering UA. We find out when the narrative introduces Aizawa. He has a very cut and dry view of what he expects from his students, and he is very skeptical of Midoriya's potential as someone with a quirk they cannot control. He even directly contradicts All Might when he says, with your quirk, you cannot become a hero. He also threatens to expel whoever does worse at the physical tests he puts them through. Even though this is an overdone trope, the physical tests themselves show off the two My Hero Academia ingredients that make the show shine. Diversity of character, quirk, and application, as well as the growth of our main character. Seeing Ochako score infinity in the ball throw by making the ball weightless, or Aoyama using his naval laser to propel himself during the foot race, gets your imagination wondering about the ways that Class 1A can use these quirks in different situations. As for the growth of Midoriya, we see him forego instinct and use his analytical mind to solve a problem using his new quirk. Aizawa tells him that he can either get an average score in the ball throw, making him come last, or he can use his quirk and incapacitate himself making him a burden on everyone else. Midoriya's response? He throws the ball while only using power from the tip of his finger, giving him the distance of an extraordinary throw, while keeping damage to himself at a minimum. A clear distinction from when he saved Ochako and could barely move afterwards. Even more than Bakugo's tantrum, which I will get into soon, I love Aizawa's response to this. He's not mad or annoyed that this kid has shown him up. He's happy to be proven wrong and learn that Midoriya might have some potential after all. Now, I'm not going to pretend for a second that the threat of expulsion being an empty one is any kind of twist. As I said before, this trope is an old one that can never really raise tension because you know that following through would mean ending the show. However, it gives us more insight into the potential Aizawa sees in Midoriya. In a conversation with All Might, we discover that Aizawa once expelled an entire class of people who didn't meet his expectations. This revelation doesn't add tension to the previous scene, but it clarifies that he would have absolutely expelled Midoriya if he had seen zero potential in him. Also, just want to say, I hope that we can do this physical exam thing again in a later season. 
I would love to see how each character, especially Midoriya and Ochako, would improve their scores following the development we've seen since this point. The combat training takes place afterwards, and it is here that we are finally going to talk about Katsuki Bakugo. I hate Bakugo in Season 1. I don't necessarily like him now in Season 5, but I despised him in Season 1. People were confused when I said this. They were quick to point out that he has a superiority complex and insecurities that he acts on with a disastrous coping mechanism. But here's the thing. I viewed Bakugo the same way I view most bullies. Sure, they probably have something messed up going on behind the scenes, but frankly, that's not my problem. And it doesn't subtract from the anguish they inflict onto others. I don't care how sad the explodey boy is, he told Midoriya to jump off a building, so I hated him. We find out during combat training why he hates Midoriya as much as he does. Bakugo has always considered himself superior to everyone, so when Midoriya asked if he was okay after falling into the river, he perceived it as a slight, as Midoriya looking down on him. He actively takes joy in the news that Midoriya doesn't have a quirk, throws that aforementioned tantrum after seeing him use his newly attained quirk for the first time, FYI, seeing Aizawa restrain him like a rabid animal was a glorious sight. And he's so narcissistic that he believes that Midoriya has hidden his quirk this whole time only to trick him. It's also in this part of the show that his character arc is made clear. For the first time in his life, he isn't the greatest. He's intimidated by Todoroki, he gets thrown over Midoriya's shoulder and told he isn't a threat to him anymore, and when he has the flaws in his character and hero ability pointed out by Momo, he can't help but agree. Of course, it is possible to understand this and still dislike him as a character. Bakugo is similar to Yu from Charlotte in many ways regarding his sense of superiority. But while Yu is ground into the dirt and made to suffer for his arrogance from episode 1, Bakugo more or less goes unchallenged and never faces any real consequences for his violent outbursts or superior attitude. His arrogance even becomes an obstacle that our characters have to work around in later seasons. The combat training and the brief classroom conversation afterwards makes for an excellent opportunity to talk about some more classmates, or at least the ones who don't get a chance to shine during the USJ incident. Koji Koda is kind of a non-presence in this season. I understand that he doesn't speak due to being shy, but he hardly plays any significant role in season 1. He doesn't even demonstrate his quirk. He does get a standout moment later in the show, but there isn't really anything to say about him for the time being. Same with Toru. While her quirk is unique and the way she uses it is suitable for awkward comedy and fun imagery, she also doesn't play a significant role this season. Unfortunately, she doesn't really play a role in the show overall, at least not yet as of writing this script while the show is airing its fifth season. Aoyama is someone who we get to know a little better, and he's an entertaining presence. Like Bakugo, he has a very high image of himself, but it doesn't translate into cruelty, rather a smug sense of self-hype. He does look down on Midoriya the first time they meet, as Ida does, but he kind of looks down on everyone in a way. The running joke with Aoyama is that he is the only one who believes his own hype, as most other students just ignore him, and no one ignores him better than Ashido. Certainly the most uniquely designed character in the class, she has this excitable party girl mentality. We also get a good look at how she utilises her quirk, which excites us to see how she may use it in the future. Following the combat training, we get the class representative episode, which feels a bit fillery in terms of pace, but provides important foreshadowing and a good look into the character of Tenya Ida. As I vaguely mentioned earlier, Ida starts as something of an antagonist to Midoriya. His passion for the rules come from his respect for UA as an institution. His initial animosity towards Midoriya came from a belief that he wasn't taking the entrance exam seriously, thus disrespecting that great institution. Once Midoriya is accepted into the school, Ida acknowledges that he was wrong and becomes a more friendly presence. 
During the class representative episode, we learn that he can make logical decisions regardless of any selfish desire. He's one of three people in Class 1A to vote for someone else as class representative, irrespective of how much he wanted to do it and how he had already been filling that role. He describes himself as the type of hero who wants to save people by being an effective leader, and we see him accomplish this through action in the following scene. When the school's intruder alarm goes off, the students panic and get caught in a corridor. Most students are preoccupied with getting to the exit and don't notice what is happening outside. Ida is the only one who sees the intruders are just press, or at least the only one to do something that genuinely calms the crowd. He asks Ochako to make him float, hilariously crashes into the wall spread out like a little exit sign man, and informs the students that there is no danger. I thought this scene was pretty cool, and it made me see Ida as the kind of leader he aspires to be. The breach that leads to this break-in ultimately foreshadows the season's final arc, the USJ incident. The Unforeseen Situation Joint, or USJ, is a pretty neat bit of world building. A large arena full of different disaster types is precisely the kind of thing you would see at a superhero school with a bottomless budget. The fact that it's a long way from the school's main campus means it's a logical place for a villain attack in-universe, and the fact that it has several terrain types and aesthetics means that the environments for the next few episodes can be vastly different despite taking place in a single location. This is also the part of the show where Aizawa truly steps up. As an audience, we already know his quirk, his weakness, and how he uses the wrapping around his neck. What we didn't know before was that he is a total badass, able to destroy hordes of thugs by erasing their quirks and flinging them into each other. His last words before this brawl highlight the show's diversity of character. You can't be a hero with just one trick. Of course, the USJ incident doesn't truly start until Kurogiri scatters most of Class 1A among the different test areas. Midoriya drops into the flood zone with Suyu Asui and Minoru Mineta. We learn a lot about these two characters from the following scenes, and I'm going to talk about them now. Asui is one of my favourite Class 1A members. She's friendly, she doesn't so much as flinch when Bakugo has another tantrum towards her, and her quirk has a lot of utility. The running joke around her character for a little while is that whenever Midoriya says her name, she insists on being called Sue. Despite that being a nickname, something that infers a level of familiarity and closeness in Japanese culture. I love that when Midoriya struggles to extend this gesture of intimacy, Asui tells him that he can go at his own pace, and I think that's really sweet. She's also the most proactive participant in the Flood Zone, saving Midoriya shortly after he is dropped into the water, and continuing to keep Mineta safe as much as he doesn't deserve it. Uh-oh, I think I may have given away how I feel about Mineta. Now, for most Class 1A characters, I'm trying to stick to what I know about them from Season 1, and not let future events influence this retrospective too much. But this is not a concern for Mineta, because I feel the same way about him in Season 5 that I did back in Season 1. Mineta is the worst. Like, at least Bakugo becomes less of a scumbag as the series goes on. Mineta, on the other hand, is seemingly only there to pander to specific anime fans that are as pathetic as he is. Am I supposed to be turned on when he gropes Asui? Or am I supposed to laugh? Because the show doesn't accomplish either of those things. I don't even laugh when she tries to drown him afterwards. That moment isn't funny, it's vindicating. Here's the thing. I could at least dismiss Mineta as inconsequential if it weren't for the fact that the show actively puts him in situations to be admired. Now, I'm not about to condemn him for being scared during the USJ incident, which is essentially a terrorist attack on the school. Of course, I don't expect anyone to want to fight in those circumstances. But as they evade the villains in the flood zone, he uses his quirk to stick them all together, and the show acts as though this is some grand moment for him but I don't think it is. Yes, using his quirk did help, and they wouldn't have made as clean a getaway without him, but all he really did was throw balls towards a whirlpool. I can't help but look forward to a similar moment in Season 3 with Aoyama. This moment does the scared hero in training steps up thing well, because he actually had to put himself in danger to do it. 
he actually had to step up and put someone else before himself. In comparison, this moment with Mineta is just weak. I can't help but roll my eyes when Sue says you're both amazing, because no, you're amazing, Midoriya is amazing, Mineta is a burden on this show and I honestly just wish he wasn't here. Alright, that was a mighty long tangent, now let's get back to the good characters. We cut to Shoto Todoroki, who has far more going for him in later seasons than he does here, quite subtly foreshadowed by his costume covering the left side of his body with ice. Todoroki comes off as somewhat arrogant in this first season. We're introduced to him telling Shoji to leave the combat training area so that he can win it on his own which he does with ease. We realise that this arrogance is justified by his combat ability, when he quickly apprehends all the villains in the landslide zone. I'll have much more to say about him in the next retrospective video, but for now all I can say is that he's intimidating, he's arrogant, and dare I say, very cool. Following this we see Jiro, Momo, and Kiminari fighting a squad of villains in the mountain zone. Jiro has this punk look about her, which matches her sound-based quirk and aggressive attitude. We saw during the combat training that she can use this quirk for reconnaissance, but she can also emit a loud sound as a weapon. I can't remember whether or not she and Kiminari ever become friends, but kicking him towards a villain wouldn't have made a great first impression, even if it did work out in the end. Kiminari in season 1 comes off as one of those confident, slightly cocky guys who mostly hangs out with other confident, slightly cocky guys. I think it's cool that as soon as he finds a practical combat use for his power, he goes all out, showing that he will work to make his friends safe if given the opportunity. I also think it's hilarious that following a large surge of energy, he becomes a dopey git for a little while. And then we have Momo Yayorozu. She probably has one of the coolest quirks in Class 1A. She can create anything she wants from her body, so long as she understands its structure on a molecular level. That's a fantastic quirk, with a high enough barrier to entry that she cannot use it to solve any problem the narrative presents. While Momo doesn't get a character arc until later in the show, for the time being she's one of the more level-headed and competent characters. And while it's arguable whether or not it's appropriate that using her quirk can leave her exposed, it is refreshing to see a character who doesn't get flustered over it. We then cut to the class members who were not warped away from the entrance. Ochako, Ida, and Ashido, who I've already talked about, as well as Shoji, Sero, and Sato. While most class members in the USJ are concerned with staying safe amongst a crowd of villains, the goal of this group is to get Ida out the door to get help. After encouraging words from the students he was voted to lead, he takes off towards the exit. When Kurogiri tries to cut Ida off, the first to step up is Shoji, who uses his unique arm structure to trap the warp gate, buying Ida some time. Shoji's only real standout moment so far has been getting told to get out of the way by Todoroki, so it's nice to see him get a moment to shine in a way that's unique to him, showcases his bravery, and creates a clear advantage in their situation. When Kurogiri tries to stop Ida again, Ochako figures out that he has a physical body that she can use her quirk on to create another obstacle. When Kurogiri tries to close the distance, Sero grabs a hold of his weightless body with his tape, and Sato uses this tape to launch Kurogiri into the air, giving Ida the time he needs to open the door and make his escape. There isn't much to say about Sero or Sato other than pointing out their role in the USJ incident. Sero does have a pretty neat quirk that we will see him utilise in more exciting ways later, and Sato is a pretty cool dude. As I said, I have far more to say about some characters than others. We then go to the Ruin Zone with Bakugo and Kirishima. It's kind of their fault that Kurogiri had the chance to scatter the students in the first place for attacking him before 13 could use their quirk. However, we see later that 13's quirk doesn't work against Kurogiri, so they probably just sped up the inevitable. We're first introduced to Kirishima spectating the fight between Midoriya and Bakugo, framing all of his comments over what is and isn't manly. He isn't a total beefhead. While observing that Midoriya retreating isn't manly, he also acknowledges that he has no choice. 
His attack on Kurogiri shows that the confidence he has in his own abilities match Bakugo's, even though he admits later that it was probably the wrong thing to do. What we ultimately learn about him during the USJ incident is that he respects chivalry and what he perceives to be manly. As he decides to follow Bakugo in doing something reckless just because of the manly confidence he exudes. We then get a quick look at the other Class 1A students, and I'll use this opportunity to finish off the list. Ojiro is unique in that his quirk does not define his fighting style, the way that Todoroki or Bakugo's does. It's more like he's a skilled martial artist with a quirk that boosts his effectiveness. Ojiro has the kind of quirk that could be utterly useless in the hands of someone less disciplined, but he's figured out the optimal way to use it. Last but certainly not least, we see Tokoyami, who shows off more of his dark and currently mysterious quirk. We saw it briefly during the combat training and see a little more of it now, but there's still more to learn about it in future seasons. Tokoyami is a bit of a brooding misery guts in season 1. In our first real look at him, he's sitting on his desk like an edgy teenager and complaining about how loud everyone has been. And that's all we get until he seemingly lightens up in season 2. I do like Tokoyami a lot, I just don't think he presents his best self in season 1. Of course, the USJ incident isn't all victory. After taking out a small army of thugs, Aizawa comes face to face with the Nomu, the secret weapon brought specifically to kill All Might. Needless to say, he gets completely obliterated. At this point, we realise what a threat this group is beyond the never-ending stream of cannon fodder thugs. The following scene has three spectacular elements that increase my admiration for two of the characters involved and hints at Midoriya's development. The leader of this assault, Shigaraki, who's already intimidated us with his unsettling appearance and dangerous quirk, goes to use that quirk against Asui, truly exposing the sinister and destructive nature of this group. Sure, we've seen villains attack the students and talk about killing them, but this is the most overt and near successful attempt to do so. Aizawa manages to erase Shigaraki's quirk right before impact, and it was from this moment that I did not doubt Aizawa's dedication to his students, even if he acts disinterested in class or treats his students harshly. He will literally stop at nothing to keep them safe. Given that slight bit of time, Midoriya jumps up and goes to punch Shigaraki full force, and interestingly, he doesn't break his arm in the process. Now, I'm not as interested in the in-universe mechanics of why his arm doesn't break here, as I am in its narrative significance. This moment provides a glimpse at the kind of hero that Midoriya could be that he may one day control his power to the extent that he can deliver powerful blows without hurting himself. Lastly, when the Nomu takes the hit and tries to retaliate, Asui has what I believe is a hero instinct moment, where she tries to get Midoriya out of harm's way. The show doesn't explicitly state this, but it's made clear by the fact that she's trying to save him instead of evading Shigaraki's follow-up attack. It is at this point that All Might arrives on the scene. His triumphant music plays and people are glad to see him. That's all standard. But this entrance is different. He isn't smiling. All Might's smile has always been a measure to reassure the people he is saving, and exert enough confidence in a situation that it puts others at ease. But right now he is so angry at the villains for attacking his students, and himself for not being there, that there is no smile. He is able to get Aizawa, Asui, Mineta and Midoriya out of harm's way in an instant. And the next phase of the USJ incident begins. All Might's entrance is one of two turning points. This one puts the audience at ease for a moment as it ensures the safety of our main characters. However, there's also tension in that we know All Might is near his limit and that this Nomu has already taken a punch as powerful as his. Initially, I was excited to see All Might fight smarter and not harder. The narrative set up Nomu as an adversary that All Might couldn't just punch away. And after trying to punch it away, he begins to lose. All Might would have died in this fight if not for the intervention of Todoroki, Bakugo, and Kirishima. 
Side note, Bakugo's capture of Kurogiri is the only time I don't mind his more psychotic mannerisms and threats. Would have been a lot more intimidating if this wasn't his default, but what are you gonna do? This is probably the best time to talk about Shigaraki. He began the invasion competent and intimidating, but after being informed about Ida's escape, he exposes his true self as petty and childish. He uses this opportunity to explain why he did any of this in the first place. He claims a hypocritical double standard exists between villains who are violent for their own sake and heroes who are violent to stop villains. All Might points out that this is garbage. Of course there's a difference between violence for the sake of self-interest and violence for the sake of protection. And Shigaraki kind of shrugs his shoulders and goes, Ah, you got me. And then commences his plan. I understand that Shigaraki just wants to watch the world burn, but this is still a very odd moment. All Might eventually defeats the Nomu by punching it so hard and fast that it negates its shock absorption quirk and sends it flying. So it is a villain that All Might could punch away. He just wasn't punching hard enough. I get that this happens to accentuate the school's motto, plus ultra, meaning to go beyond one's natural limit, and that it's here to show off how powerful Midoriya could someday be. However, it's still a rather underwhelming resolution to the fight, especially after we saw other students defeat their adversaries in more creative ways. After Nomu's defeat, we get another brief low point when a strong villain takes Kiminari hostage and Shigaraki decides to try his luck at killing All Might himself, while All Might is at his limit. The lowest of this low point comes when Midoriya is about to be killed by Shigaraki after intervening in another heroic instinct moment. This low point is only here to contrast against the thrill that comes with the final turning point the arrival of the UA teachers. This sequence is sensational. We're introduced first to Snipe's pinpoint accuracy, disabling Shigaraki and the villain holding Kaminari. I love that present Mike walks past a brutalized Aizawa, someone we will later learn was a high school friend and use his quirk to immobilize the villains immediately in front of them. The fact that all the UA teachers deal with the villains far more quickly than the students shows us how much they have to grow. And after a hasty retreat by Shigaraki and Kurogiri, the USJ incident is over. You might have noticed that the USJ incident has taken up most of this video, despite only taking up four and a half of the first season's 13 episodes. That's because as someone who has watched the show, I understand the impact the USJ incident has on the narrative. The show explicitly points out that this traumatic event will forever shift Class 1A's development. We most explicitly understand this through the rivalry with Class 1B, and less explicitly in how they deal with conflict going forward, how willing they are to act in future situations, and how they conduct themselves in the more tense scenes. It sets up the beginning of the end for All Might, telling us that the more he pushes himself like this, the less time he can sustain his muscle form. It even sets up some plot points that have not been resolved yet in the anime adaptation. Shigaraki mentions when arriving that All Might was supposed to be there, implying that Yue has a traitor in their midst. I'm going to return to something I said at the start of this retrospective video. The two most important aspects of My Hero Academia's storytelling is diversity among character, quirk, and application, and the growth of Midoriya. It would have been so easy to have the only named and explored characters in Class 1A be the leading players. Even good superhero shows like Charlotte are guilty of this. But instead, each character has a unique ability, aesthetic, and personality. There's even diversity in the practicality of each quirk. Sato and Kirishima are far more suited to combat than Koda or Ochako. Momo's quirk has the most versatility but also has the highest barrier to entry. Tokoyami has a quirk that could potentially have its own will, and Asui's single quirk is actually three or four quirks rolled into one. We've already seen these characters utilize their quirks in exciting ways and it's only going to get better from here. 
Midoriya is your typical anime go-getter. His real strength comes from his analytical mind, which he used to take down Bakugo and a platoon of villains. He's clearly making the most of this opportunity given to him by All Might, and there's a clear sense of progression. From a pushover who couldn't do anything, to someone who could do something but hurt themselves in the process, to a more confident hero who could help while keeping personal damage to a minimum. And seeing how All Might dealt with Anomu, as uninspired as it was, still gets us excited to see Midoriya become stronger. And the first season ended in a way that made it clear that the story was just getting started. Yes, it accomplishes this with a standard cliffhanger, teasing the hero killer Stain. However, it also promises that the USJ incident is just the beginning for our characters, and that Midoriya has a lot of growth ahead of him. This is why the show stands among the greatest superhero stories. The amount of detail and creativity in how the superpowers work and the people who use them is unprecedented. Not content in presenting the bare minimum, the writers truly went beyond reasonable expectations. And in the end, what's more plus ultra than that? That's all for this retrospective. I'd like to thank my patrons, Orion Tran, Lars Espen, Data52, Jaman5, Lemon Shark, Pix Calibar, Alberto Cruz, Tyler Bennett, Temka, Jeremy Pashik, Fireclaw, and Soren. If you would like to support this channel further, consider becoming a patron yourself. Thank you all very much for watching, and I will see you next time.